Now we are essentially done discussing the bowel, and we'll spend some time learning about the liver before finishing with pancreatic pathology. First, let's go over this diagram showing all the sequelae of cirrhosis. Portal hypertension is a more broad category of which cirrhosis is one possible cause. Cirro is the Greek term for tawny yellow. Tawny yellow describes the color of jaundice. Cirrhosis is the technical term for diffuse fibrosis of the liver, where the normal architecture has been destroyed. There is some amount of nodular regeneration, and cirrhosis has been described by some as being either micronodular or macronodular, which may have some prognostic significance. Micronodular cirrhosis is due to metabolic insults, which include alcohol, hemochromatosis, and Wilson's disease. Macronodular is from significant liver injury, such as post-infectious or drug-induced hepatitis. The macronodular forms demonstrate a higher risk of HCC, or hepatocellular carcinoma. As we've discussed in detail before, portal hypertension can be relieved by a variety of different portosystemic anastomoses. Now, let's take a look at the effects of cirrhosis on the rest of the body. There are a lot, and they are all related to the failure of the liver to carry out its intended functions. We can divide these into the effects of portal hypertension and the effects of liver cell failure. As you can tell, the liver is a critical organ with many, many functions, and destroying it through cirrhosis is devastating. The first thing we mentioned was jaundice, which is how cirrhosis got its name. The buildup of bilirubin in the blood, which we also discussed earlier, gives the skin a tawny yellow color, which can be observed at its earliest stages in the eyes before changing of the skin color. Other skin manifestations include spider nevi and caput medusae. As a review, what vessels anastomose to form the caput medusae? It's the paraumbilical and the superficial and inferior epigastrics. Now we'll go head to toe for some of the other effects. Decompensated cirrhosis can put patients into a coma. Scleral icterus is the technical term for the jaundice of the eyes, which we already discussed. Fetor hepaticus is a foul smell to the breath that may be apparent in late stages. Gynecomastia and testicular atrophy due to the increased estrogens and ankle edema. A physical exam finding you may elicit is asterixis or the liver flap. Lab findings would include anemia and bleeding tendencies, specifically a decrease in prothrombin and clotting factors, all important things that are made by the liver. Lastly, we'll mention the effects of portal hypertension, which you are already familiar with. The mnemonic we used before was gut, butt, and kaput. And it still applies. You can have esophageal varices, hemorrhoids, and kaput medusae. Additionally, patients develop peptic ulcers, splenomegaly, ascites, and gastropathy. Truly, there are many painful consequences to cirrhosis. Next, let's go over some of the important blood labs in liver and pancreas pathology. These are important both for the boards and for your upcoming clinics. Alkaline phosphatase, or ALP, rises in obstructive liver disease, such as hepatocellular carcinoma or bile duct disorders. However, it is also elevated in bone diseases, so it's not uniformly specific. Two amino transferases, AST and ALT, are used to differentiate viral and alcoholic hepatitis. In viral hepatitis, the ALT level is higher than the AST level. And in alcoholic hepatitis, the AST level is greater than the ALT. AST elevations are also seen in myocardial infarctions. While these rules are generally true, there can be instances, as in all things, in which they are not. A good way to remember this is that scotch and tonic, 
or AAST, increase with alcohol. Amylase and lipase are both markers for acute pancreatitis, and amylase is also elevated in mumps. The amylase in the latter is the one that is secreted usually by your salivary glands, as opposed to pancreatic amylase. GGT, or gamma glutamyl transpeptidase, is typically ordered to confirm heavy alcohol consumption, though it can be elevated in various conditions. However, it is not elevated in bone disease, unlike ALP. Lastly, ceruloplasmin levels are decreased in Wilson's disease. We'll talk about each of these conditions in more detail and review these lab tests, so this may be a helpful table to come back to as you review. Rye syndrome is a rare, often fatal, childhood hepatosencephalopathy. There are mitochondrial abnormalities in microvesicular fatty liver. Here you can see the increased amounts of fat stored in the liver. Clinically, patients develop hypoglycemia as well as coma. It is associated with viral infections, particularly varicella zoster and influenza B, followed by treatment with salicylates. The aspirin metabolites reversibly inhibit a mitochondrial enzyme that is necessary for beta oxidation. Therefore, it is really important not to give children aspirin. The only time you would give children aspirin is in this case of Kawasaki disease, and here the benefits would outweigh the risks. Even moderate alcohol intake in the occasional social drinker can induce hepatic steatosis, which consists of a macrovesicular fatty change, which you can see here in these fat droplets. This is completely reversible. With sustained long-term consumption, though, patients can go on to develop alcoholic hepatitis. Liver biopsies will show swollen and necrotic hepatocytes, neutrophilic infiltration, and the distinctive Mallory bodies. Mallory bodies are eosinophilic inclusions in the cytoplasm of the hepatocytes, which you can see here. As we mentioned, the AST levels are higher than ALT levels. This is typically a ratio of over 1.5. The mnemonic that may help you with that is that you're toasted with alcoholic hepatitis. In severe cases of alcohol abuse, cirrhosis can unfortunately develop. At this stage, the damage is irreversible. The liver becomes irregular and shrunken, has micronodular regeneration, and there is a so-called hobnail appearance. Sclerosis develops around zone 3, which contains what? That's right, the central vein. Only when the liver pathology has progressed from hepatitis to cirrhosis do the patients start to develop the stigmata of liver disease, such as jaundice. Okay, let's review and do a flash quiz. Can you list two hematologic abnormalities that may result from liver cell failure in patients with cirrhosis? That's right, there's an increased bleeding tendency and anemia due to the liver's inability to form the necessary clotting factors. Let's go on now to discuss non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is exactly as the name implies, fatty liver caused by non-alcohol mechanisms. It is instead a metabolic disease and is related to insulin resistance. The fatty deposits cause cellular ballooning and eventually necrosis. Damage to the liver may cause cirrhosis and HCC. Here, ALT is greater than AST. You can remember this by thinking of L for lipids. Hepatic encephalopathy is another consequence of liver failure, as we mentioned before. As a result of the cirrhosis and decreased hepatocyte function, toxic substances build up, such as ammonia. 
This then can cause confusion, asterixis, altered levels of consciousness, and coma. This can be triggered by things that increase ammonia production and or decrease ammonia removal, as you would guess. Such things that increase ammonia are things such as dietary protein, GI bleeds, constipation, and infection. Decreased ammonia removal can be caused by renal failure, diuretics, and post-tips. Treatment includes lactulose, which helps draw out ammonia. Lactulose is metabolized by the colonic bacteria, which acidifies the colonic contents and favors the formation of non-absorbable ammonium. Treatments also include a low-protein diet and rifaximin to kill intestinal bacteria. Let's next go on to hepatocellular carcinoma and hepatoma. Liver cancer is a major global health problem. Hepatocellular carcinoma, or HCC, is the most common primary malignant tumor of the liver. Some preceding insults include hepatitis B, hepatitis C, Wilson's disease, hemochromatosis, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, alcoholic cirrhosis, and carcinogens such as aflatoxin from aspergillus. The findings in HCC are similar to those in cirrhosis, so what would those be? Well, they are things such as jaundice, hepatomegaly, ascites, polycythemia, and hypoglycemia. HCC spreads hematogenously, and the tumor marker for this cancer is alpha-fetoprotein, or AFP. It can also be diagnosed via ultrasound and contrast CT. HCC can lead to the Bud Chiari syndrome, which we'll discuss in a moment. Here on CT, we can see a very large HCC. Let's talk about some of the other liver tumors we can also see. Cavernous hemangioma are benign growths of the liver that usually occur in older adults. Since they are vascular structures, they should not be biopsied. If you do get a case about these, you'll usually see these structures enhance with contrast, since they are very vascular, and they will also show up in patients without any real risk factors for HCC. A hepatic adenoma is a rare, benign liver tumor that is associated with oral contraceptive or steroid use. Usually, they're asymptomatic and can regress spontaneously, but they can progress to a malignancy. Finally, angiosarcoma is a rare malignant tumor of endothelial origin, and it is associated with exposure to arsenic, polyvinyl chloride, or PVC. Here, the arrow is pointing to an angiosarcoma. Next, let's talk about nutmeg liver. Nutmeg liver is caused by a backup of blood into the liver, typically from either right-sided heart failure or Bud Chiari syndrome, which I'll talk about in a second. Either way, it's due to post-hepatic backflow into the liver. The source of the name is the gross appearance of the liver, which some people felt looked like a nutmeg, which you can see on the right. If the heart failure is not adequately treated, centrilobular congestion and necrosis may develop and cause cardiac cirrhosis. Okay, I promise we'd talk about Bud Chiari syndrome, so here we go. Bud Chiari syndrome develops upon occlusion of the IVC or hepatic veins. Pathologically, the liver develops centrolobular congestion and necrosis, just like we saw with nutmeg liver. Here, the arrow shows a blood clot in the IVC. Congestive liver disease is the result, and findings include hepatomegaly, ascites, abdominal pain, and eventually complete liver failure. Varices can develop, and anastomoses can cause veins in the abdomen and back to stand out. There is no jugular venous distension because of the occlusion. Some associations include hypercoagulable states, polycythemia vera, pregnancy, and HCC. Okay, let's do a flash quiz just to review. 
What liver region becomes congested and necrotic in Bud Chiari syndrome? That's right, it's the centrolobular region. Okay, next, we're just going to do a brief mention of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. This is a co-dominant genetic disease. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency results in a misfolded gene product protein that accumulates in the endoplasmic reticulum of hepatocytes. Because the enzyme cannot leave hepatocytes to travel to its usual site of protective action in the lungs, panacinar emphysema develops. Liver biopsy will show PAS-positive diastase-resistant globules.